Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3, An American Perspective on Criminal Law. It's referred to as an American perspective because criminal law does take different approaches and different items are emphasized uh, in other parts of the, of the world. Um, but I believe that the American perspective title might also be a little bit misleading because some of the terms that we're going to be talking about are pretty well understood and accepted in most any legal system. Things like uh, mens rea, actus reus, and so on. Uh, so don't be too misled by uh, that American perspective. Uh, I included it as part of the chapter title uh, just to make sure that we understand that there are other ways that could be taken uh, to understand criminal law and to uh, identify particular key points of criminal law. Also, let me mention that uh, I am a sociologist. I do not have a law degree. And uh, my understanding of criminal law comes from a social science perspective. And uh, as a result, my absence of legal training means that I uh, may not be explaining things in the same way that law students and lawyers are used to understanding them. I don't really apologize for that, but I do bring it uh, to your attention uh, because I think that it's uh, possible uh, that as I'm going through, or as you're reading the chapter and as I'm talking about it, uh, that there may be a few points that you would uh, disagree with me on, as would maybe your law professors. Perfectly acceptable, and I have no problem with that as well, at, at all. And in the discussion board, you're welcome to uh, bring up some of those differences. Uh, but uh, these are the the points and the understandings as I have of them, and keep in mind then that it's going to be uh, a more broad-based and a general understanding of these particular aspects of criminal law uh, than what lawyers might um, get into uh, re regarding the specifics. But with those little asides, let me uh, move into this then and talk about what are considered to be the essential ingredients of any justice system. As the slide points out, all societies have to resolve uh, two problems before they can implement any kind of institutionalized criminal justice system. First of all, the laws must be delineated or defined. And this is the area of substantive or substantive law. Secondly, the manner in which those laws are going to be enforced has to be specified. And it's this area of law that we refer to as procedural law. We're going to be looking at substantive law and procedural law not only from uh, chapter 3's perspective, uh, but we'll be returning to it in chapter 5 after the introduction of the four legal traditions that we're going to be using to kind of orient uh, the remaining part of the chapter, or of the book, I should say. Uh, so let's take a look at each of these. Uh, first of all, substantive law is going to include such things as how a crime is defined and what's required for criminal responsibility. Procedural law, on the other hand, is going to look at such things as how the rules are implemented. I've broken this chapter, as I have the first two, into sections. Uh, this chapter three will have two parts. And in this first part, we're going to look at substantive law. And then part two will cover procedural law. So as we look at substantive law, a couple things to keep in mind. When we're concerned with how a crime is defined, we are looking specifically at what are generally referred to as the uh, characteristics uh, of uh, criminal law, of substantive criminal law more specifically. And those characteristics are said to be four in number and identified as being politicality, specificity, uniformity, and penal sanction. The idea here is that all criminal laws must share these characteristics. They must be or, or have an aspect of politicality in the sense that for it to be a crime, it has to be um, propagated by a political authority. You cannot have something that is a crime because your soccer coach has told you it's a, it's a crime. Uh, your, your coach might say you've got to be in by 10 p.m. each evening before a game. That can be a rule. It can be a rule that bad things can happen to you if you break it, uh, but it's not a crime because it wasn't presented by a political authority. So we first of all say that for something to be a crime, there has to be some politicality aspect to it. A crime also has to have specificity. 
Um, now, these are general characteristics, and as a result of that, we uh, they are more ideals to be strived toward rather than things that we absolutely know. Uh, ideally, each crime is specific in its nature. Again, we know that's not always true. We have very, or at least rather vague crimes. Things like loitering is not always well defined. Um, in uh, Europe, more specifically in uh, the old Soviet Union, uh, the crime of hooliganism uh, was a very general, broad-based crime that allowed uh, authorities to arrest individuals, or at least uh, stop and, and, and question them, based upon rather loose criteria. And that, of course, is the problem with uh, crimes that are not specific. Uh, when you provide more and more vagueness, uh, you increase the possibility of uh, well, human rights being violated, for example, by the authorities. Uh, so specificity is an ideal. It's something that um, when crimes are, or when laws are drawn up, that legislators try to strive toward to make them specific in their nature. Also, crimes should have uniformity as one of their general characteristics. Uniformity in the sense that they should apply to everyone, uh, regardless of the person's social status, uh, uh, gender, um, uh, region that they live in, uh, any of those kinds of things. Uh, crimes are to be uniform, uniformly applied, and uh, defined in a manner that is uniform to all individuals in that particular jurisdiction, regardless of any extra-legal kind of characteristics they might have. And the last of the four general characteristics is penal sanction. In order for something to be a crime, there has to be a punishment uh, identified. Now this sounds kind of um, odd, straightforward, that is, uh, why bother to even make something criminal if you're not going to have a punishment applied? But it is an important one, uh, because without that last characteristic, uh, you can't have something be a crime. Uh, for example, there are motorcycle helmet laws uh, in some states, and when those laws first began uh, being uh, passed, uh, there were some legislators in some states that said, well, let's pass the law, uh, but we're not going to provide any penalty for it. Uh, you can imagine being a um, police officer, a state trooper, pulling somebody over for not wearing a helmet and uh, approaching the individuals and saying, you've committed the crime of not wearing a helmet or riding a motorcycle. And the um, helmetless rider says, well, so what? Uh, if there is no penal sanction attached to that crime, the trooper's only response is, well, I just wanted to bring it to your attention. You can't do anything about it if there isn't a penal sanction applied. Some states just or still have um, adultery as a, a crime on the books. Typically, or not typically, but at least in some instances, there is no punishment attached to that, uh, that crime. Uh, but again, uh, it would be difficult, as you can imagine, for politicians to uh, pass uh, or to, re to uh, decriminalize, if you will, uh, adultery. Uh, so in some states it's kept on the books, but there's no crime attached to it, which takes, of course, uh, I'm sorry, there's no penalty attached to it, which uh, means that it can't be uh, enforced. There is, no, there is no penalty. So these are the four general characteristics. Uh, ideally, they would be characteristics found in the criminal laws, uh, not just in the United States uh, or other Western democracies, but throughout the world. Uh, it would be difficult to identify or to, to, uh, to conceive of a set of laws that didn't share these characteristics of politicality, specificity, uniformity, and penal sanction. Keeping in mind, again, that we fully understand that these are ideals, and especially in terms of specificity and uniformity, uh, we may be lacking um, in all countries in having our, our crimes achieve those general characteristics. The other grouping are major principles. And the idea here is that when we try to understand when a criminal act has occurred, that is, when has criminal responsibility uh, been assigned to an individual, there are certain major principles that we keep in mind, certain things that uh, need to have been um, met when talking about something as having been an, a, a crime. And those ident are identified as being mens rea, actus reus, concurrence, harm, causation, punishment, and legality. I'm not going to say too much about punishment and legality because they in some ways just repeat what we talked about in terms of general characteristics. 
major principle of legality is simply saying that uh, what you did, there had to have been some kind of law against it. It has to have been a legally prohibited action. Um, punishment, same type of thing, uh, that you have to have a punishment or a penal sanction attached to something in order for criminal responsibility to kick in. So those others, uh, mens rea, actus reus, uh, concurrence, harm, and causation, are the ones that I want to spend a little bit more time on. And again, we have to keep in mind that these are principles, and as such, like the characteristics, they are things that we strive toward but don't always achieve. Ideally, in order for anybody to be criminally responsible for their actions, they have to have intent. They have to have a, a guilty mind, mens rea. Uh, without that intent, presumably, a crime has not occurred, or the individual is not held criminally responsible uh, for that action. This, of course, gets to be uh, problematic. We already know of many exceptions to this. Uh, you're thinking of situations in which uh, self-defense, for example, or immaturity, or uh, a variety of other kind of situations will take hold, and those are all appropriate. And it also makes for interesting comparison across countries. Uh, in fact, when you're doing your term paper, uh, some people might be interested in comparing uh, the concept of criminal responsibility across three countries and see how each of those countries addresses this um, uh, issue and what kind of defenses to crime are raised when they uh, when they bring them up. Uh, actus reus refers to a particular conduct, the idea that for something to be a crime, uh, some kind of conduct has to be taking place, uh, some kind of uh, harmful act uh, or, or guilty act would be a better word at this point since harm is coming in later. Well, having a, a guilty mind and having conduct uh, isn't sufficient in itself. The term concurrence refers to the situation in which there was a fusion of intent and conduct. And this concurrence uh, provides some very interesting kind of situations. Uh, if you haven't yet read the uh, first paragraph of chapter 3, uh, let me just quickly remind you, or, or tell you about it if you haven't read it, or remind you about it if you have, presents a very interesting um, situation, I think. Uh, Scott Jackson, a dental student, gave cocaine to his lover with the intent to kill her and the fetus that she was carrying. He decapitated what he believed to be her dead body in an attempt to thwart identification of the body. The effort failed. That is, the victim's shoes bore the name of the store that sold them, eventually leading the police to, to Jackson. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the intent or the, uh, the hope to decapitate and thereby make, diff make uh, impossible identification didn't work for Scott Jackson. Medical testimony established that the woman had been alive at the time of decapitation. For an act to be a crime of first-degree murder, the actor must have intentionally engaged in harmful conduct. Uh, the question is, did Jackson commit first-degree murder when he gave his lover the cocaine? And, uh, or how about when he decapitated her? Well, all these kind of things are, are, are situations and problems that I'm sure that uh, those of you who are law students are used to, uh, to working with, or law graduates were used to working with. Uh, they present some very interesting um, legal uh, questions, but they also highlight this importance of concurrence, the idea that uh, it isn't sufficient just to have a guilty intent uh, or to have a guilty uh, conduct or a, a bad conduct. Uh, there has to be a, a fusion of those two. The fourth principle of harm is the idea that some, um, some harm has to, be, has to occur, something that is harmful or considered detrimental uh, to societal interests or to social interests. And in addition, uh, along with that harm, there has to be causation. That is, we have to in some way link uh, the, the behavior that occurred uh, to the harm that's considered to be uh, detrimental. Now, your textbook gives the example of um, uh, Bob uh, being poisoned by John, uh, and John had every intention to... Uh, to have Bob die as a result of the poison that he ingested. But as it turns out, um, Bob died not from the poison, but from uh, misadministered anesthesia. And so there was technically an absence of causation 
for first-degree murder. Now, there's things like attempted murder and other kinds of concerns, but uh, without that kind of, um, of, of causation, that link between the harm and the, uh, the, the behavior, it's difficult to uh, show that this particular kind of crime, in this case, first-degree murder, might have occurred. Again, other kind of crimes occurred. These issues, again, are ones that I'm sure that you cover uh, much more completely than what we're able to here, and probably much more clearly as well. Uh, but the idea is important because it does bring to mind this, I, this entire concept of criminal responsibility and the importance that it plays in substantive law. And again, it's something that, um, that some of you, I would imagine, are going to be interested in following up on and seeing how different countries go about handling these uh, issues of, uh, of substantive law, and specifically the issue of criminal responsibility. Uh, we're going to see a little bit of that when we get into Chapter 5, uh, but right now simply introducing these concepts that I suspect that you'll be wanting to come back to. Uh, that completes uh, the section on substantive criminal law from Chapter 3, and in Part 2 of the lecture on Chapter 3, we'll be covering procedural criminal law. Thank you for your attention.